I'm all right, mate. I'm all right. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm all good, thank you. I'm all good. So, no, it's nice to actually see you and speak to you because it's been a little while as well, Tanner. It has been it's nearly a year since I see you in person. It's crazy, right? How time flies. And you know what? I've been speaking to a few people recently and just saying, like, time literally does not slow down for anybody. Like, it's crazy, right? How quick time just flies by. Like, look how far we're into the year already. Like, it only just blinked and it was Christmas, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I thought you was going to recite one of your reels. Time is all we have. <laughs> we are dead yeah, before we are, we are born. We are born and we are dead. <laughs> love it. I love it. I love your insight. Yes. Great yes, time, man. Yes, right. I mean, look, time ain't waiting for no one. Like, we need to... We need to just live in the moment. Like all we ever have is this moment right now. And you know what? Like for me, I was depressed. Uh, Two thousand and nineteen, maybe uh, mainly. Sorry. Um, yeah, I went through say many months of mental misery, and during that time, I was really depressed because I was focusing say all of my thoughts and energy on the past. But then when I sort of come up and out of that depression, I focus solely on the future. And I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like in my 50s, 60s, 70s, and my mind was like right there. Bearing in mind, that may never come for me. Like, that's the reality. That may never come. So I went from depressed right back here, like in the past, to then extreme anxiety of the future, being right in the future. And then I read the book, The Power of Now. And that just brought me straight back into this present moment because it tells us that the only time that ever exists is this present moment right now. So, Absolutely. I mean, I think um, it's still glitching a little bit, but I'm, I'm getting what you're saying. But um, when you look at what depression is, it's like a past and present going round and round in the loop with no possibility of a future. And when you look at what anxiety is, it's them throwing a negative event from past into the future and this distortion, a distortion view of, of that future. And so what, you, what you're talking about there is really, really, really important. And I, I you know, say that a lot to a lot of people when they, when they talk about that. So how did you get out of your depression? You know what? So for me, it was literally one single thought that completely transformed my life. So what it was, I was, like I say, focused all on the past. I was focusing on all of my problems rather than, say, counting my blessings and yep. I was just looking at everything from a, say, negative viewpoint, um, like for a negative lens, I guess, and looking at everything that I was potentially losing, as to say, but I didn't realise there was actually a lot that I was actually gaining. Yep. And I was sat there, like, like I say, months went by, I was doing, say, I'd done some drugs, drinking, as I say, many people do. Um, but there was one single thought that literally transformed my life, and it said, could I live with the thought of dying with regrets? And I just mm -hmm. focused on that thought and I just thought about it. And obviously my journey, like I was say only just however many years back, I was laying there with zero brain activity on that hospital bed and they wanted to pull the plug on me. And I thought, you know what, if I can overcome that, I can overcome anything. And in that moment in time, you know, I, I didn't even know what gratitude meant. And I started to practice this daily gratitude every day after that thought. I, I woke up and I wrote down the things that I was, say grateful yeah grateful that i had in my life some the things that say i was pleased to have like i, ha I had all this stuff around me and i was sort of not even acknowledging it like i had a i had a home i had clothes on my back food in my fridge uh, shoes on my feet etc and i wasn't say grateful for any of that stuff back then mm -hmm. once i sort of realized that the say nightmare that i was going through was actually a dream for someone else I just changed my whole perspective on, on my life. Amazing. Um, and I think, you know, big key thing there is about gratitude. You know, if we're losing gratitude, we've lost a lot of things, you know, because without gratitude, we're not able to really focus on the moment and see heading forward around what we're actually into. And I think as people, to generalise, a lot of people focus too much on what they don't want rather than what they do want. And it's really about shifting that, you know. Um, you know, and, and I, and I re like Kelly's just put there, how do you keep feeling so positive? And if, I'm, if I may, uh, on a whim, because it's not really about being positive, because I hear that a lot. And I'll tell you where I struggle with that, is you could say, um, 
you know, uh, Ryan, I'm going to fail my exam on Friday. And you'll say, well, that's not very positive. You know, um, you've, got, you've got to be more positive, Tanner. You know, you've got to be more, okay, well, I'm positively sure I'm going to fail my exam on Friday. So we know that it's not about positivity. It's about creating and visualizing the future. So what would it be like to pass that exam on Friday? And imagine what that would be like and really start to look at how I will know that I've achieved that. I'm going to feel a sense of gratitude. I'm going to feel self-worth. I'm going to feel more able. I'm going to feel confident because then I can go and do the job that I really want. And then I start really creating those feelings. And then I'm able to feel more possible that that's going to be achievable as opposed to buying into the, the negative thoughts, if you like. So it's things like that. Oh, she's put up. <laughs> that's <one laughs> yeah, no, mate, mate. Is that, is that I love that as well because yeah no I love that because in life like what you focus on expands you get more of yeah. what you focus on whether that's say the positive or the negative so yeah. you need to say focus on the positive outcomes or the potential positive outcomes so Tana let's get um let's get into this episode today so the reason why I sort of wanted to invite you on because I've heard your journey we spoke many a times and I think who you are as a person what you've been through and what you say help others with in your life could really benefit many people so hopefully there's going to be a few people on here today that are going to take a lot away from what you have to say so the reason why I say brought you on here was to share a bit about your life journey because I know you've been through a lot especially growing up um with your say uh, singing or, or your music career um the the where that sort of lack took of, you down lack of. yeah well well we're gonna hear a little <laughs> bit about this now so yeah because it took you down an avenue right yeah um and I know like I know I know the things that you've told me, so I just want you to share a little bit about that here too. So what I want to ask you maybe to share some of the, say, challenges maybe, let's say some of the challenges that you've been through um, and what you needed to do to get you to where you are today. So maybe talk about growing up or maybe life in your 20s. And yeah, what, what did you have to do to get you to where you are today, my friend? Okay, um, so... I mean, I was always an entertainer. I was always performing um, on stage and performing off stage, I guess, but um, always a performer. I just felt, I just felt right being on stage, you know, I just felt that energy. Um, I later realised that it's also because I could become somebody else as well, I guess. So there's no wonder I liked acting and, and music and things like that. Music's always been a big part of my life and, you know, and I still use that now because it really influences the... You know, when you look at the, uh, the the frequencies in your brain, we respond differently to all different types of music, and it creates that emotion and the feeling. It's all energy, right? What is em emotion anyway, right? Energy in motion. So I've always loved that. You know, if I'm in a aggy mood, uh, I might want to listen to some serious drum and bass. If I'm in a real chilled mood and want to be zen-like, I might listen to classic FM driving in the car. I've got an array, and I love it all. Um, but performing was a big part of my life, and, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time auditioning, um, a lot and when I was about 19 it got really far and and I was signed you know, twice and it still didn't happen and it was up and down you know it's part of the industry the waves right and um, but when I was 19 it, it, it kind of hit me hard when it didn't happen and it was televised and and then everyone sort of um, we well, are open to be judged isn't it you know you look at what's happened to Will Smith today you know there's uh, there's judgments all round, you know, positive or negative. There's judgments all round, and and I signed up for that. You know, I knew that was what was going to happen, and um, and then it didn't happen. And uh, that level of exposure, um, everyone knew your name or thought they knew you, and I and I guess I really struggled with that to adjust to that. I always felt like I had to have something to say, or even if there's nothing going on, I needed to feel like I needed to say something. So uh, they don't really prepare you for that, and. Um, and although I was really excited, for me, unfortunately, you know, the outlet of drugs and alcohol was a big part of what I did. And um, and that got out of control. It got to a place where it it enhanced a lot of things. You know, I can't say I used and drank and hated it, but then it replaced a lot of things and then took over a lot of things. And eventually I, I couldn't perform without using or drinking. Um, I was just frightened. I guess, uh, you know, I, I gave in to the imposter syndrome, you know, I gave in to the negative thoughts about myself and how I looked at myself in the world. And, and that consumed me, really. And then by the time I went back again, I went and put myself through it again. I don't know why. And this was awful. And um, 
it was just the worst audition ever. And they televised it. I wasn't in control of my voice. I had no control. It just sounded like I couldn't sing. And it was terrible. And uh, I had to go back to work the next day and they weren't knowing that they, they're going to see that at some point. I didn't call in sick when it went out on TV. I actually went to work. And, you know, it was just a very dark time because I just didn't know. I was lost in the end. So basically, I drank and used every day. Um, for me, it was a, spir a downward spiral. And, um, you know, I later realized that a lot of it was due to my attachment issues, my trauma as a kid. Um, I never felt quite right. Um, I never felt part of. I was either better than or worse than, never just part of. So this took a long time for me to really settle to qualify who I was. And I didn't know who I was. I spent my time being somebody else. And, or I'll be whoever you want me to be, you know, I fit in and do whatever you want me to do, you know, and um, that's exhausting. You know, how about spending the energy about who you are, but I had no one to guide me in who I was, you know, I carried a lot of shame, I didn't want to tell anyone what was going on for me. Um, you know, it was very, very difficult. So that just kept on going and going and going and, until I was 24. And uh, I got clean at 24, got sober at 24. And... Um, and I started that journey of healing and it was hard work, man. It was tough um, because most of my friends drank. Most of my friends at the time would use. So now I can't really hang out with them because that just triggers me. And I want to be so I isolated myself from them. Um, and I just felt like I didn't belong again. Re-traumatized myself all over again. That I don't belong. I don't belong. I don't belong. That was my voice. I don't belong. I don't belong. You're a piece of shit. You don't belong. You're a piece of shit. I used to talk to myself in that way all the time. And I don't think like that today, but it, it, it's taken a lot of time for people to give me their time. And, you know, I went to a support group and, and, and stayed. And, and, I, and I've been what, clean sort of 15, nearly 16 years and day at a time. And I mean, it's the best thing I've ever done. And by doing that, it's enabled me to be the person I am because it's enabled me to show me how to show up. It's taught me how to grow up and be a man, how to look at my assets, not just my defects. You know, because I think we're, we're quite quick to point out the negatives. But actually, what about the positives? And there's a lot of positives. You know, I had a lot of energy and a lot of love to give, but just didn't feel worthy of it. Um, you know, uh, I did distance myself from friends. Um, and then I realized that some of them weren't really friends. Do you know what I mean? Um, very few of them would call me up and say, how are you? Unless it revolved around drinking drugs. And that was sad. So then I was grieving relationships, grieving that they don't actually know who I really am. <laughs> She's like, Kelly's like speaking my mind. <laughs> it's like they didn't know who I really, uh, re really am, you know, and that was tough. Um, and I think the moment came when I really realized that my self-worth meant more than just existing because that's all I was doing. I just felt like I was existing. I weren't living and I didn't know how to do that. So I learned through this, you know, and from doing that, I learned what I actually liked, what I didn't like. You know, I used to lie about the food I ate just to impress you. And I was always trying to people please all the time. It's exhausting. Um, but by doing so, it, it enabled me to show me that I, I do care and I am worth being loved and I can love and I can go and grab a life and do the best of my ability. And just because I wasn't a signed artist, it wasn't the end. And I started um doing all sorts of jobs i've done everything nightclub industry for a long time sales um but then working with kids for the talk to frank campaign was the best thing and uh it really sparked off that sort of helping continuum really and working with the youth and learning from them as much as they were learning from me and, and it really set off a, a sort of fascination with what would that be like to actually help someone willingly um without any payoff at the end of it and i loved it and uh, I wanted to know more. So I went and trained, worked at a local drug and alcohol service because um, I wanted to work in addiction specifically. And I just grew through that. People took a punt. They gave me a, a, a chance. I didn't go to university or anything like that. And, and I went my way through it. And then I went to night school and trained as a therapist, um, which, you know, I've, I've been doing for many years. And, uh, and as I said, I just started to grow through that whole industry really there isn't a job i haven't done within the addiction field whether it be criminal justice prison community drug and alcohol private sector uh, and now i'm in the nhs in mental health uh, and and i also have my own private practice for for therapy and um 
And I absolutely love it. And what this has done is I couldn't just go and do that. I had to hear or learn about myself first, Ryan, right? So once I'd done that, um, I then really started to see what value I could give to somebody else. Because just because I've gone through experience doesn't mean I know who you are. We're all individuals. But I might be able to understand a little bit better than somebody else who hasn't been through that because I have been and then we're connected. But I never, I never get it twisted. I don't know what it's like to be you. You don't know what it's like to be me. I only know what you tell me. And so my job is to really facilitate that. And so that's enabled me to go and get a life, you know? Mate, I just want to say thank you so much. Like, honestly, you just gave us so much, say, little bombs and gems there, mate. And really thank you for just being your true, authentic self because there was so much that I could say unpicked from this. Um, so, yeah, to start with, let, let's talk about the, the whole singing avenue that you went down. Um, so, from what I've heard you say before, like, you had these almost, and correct me if I'm wrong, you had these expectations up here, like, you wanted to go there to, to obviously make something of yourself. Um, and then you mentioned that day when you'd done the audition, it was almost like you couldn't sing, like, it wasn't coming out how you wanted to. So, you was maybe... Am I right in saying you was up here and then all of a sudden you're sort of dropped straight back down here? Yeah, I think um, I always wanted to perform. And yeah. and I think a lot of it was seeking validation as well. Um, I think that there's a big part in that. And I think I was of that generation back then when it was so much about fame. And, and I think there probably was an element of wanting to be famous. Um, but for what reason? And I think it was to fill in that void that perhaps if you validate me, perhaps if you accept me, then I might accept myself. It don't work that way. And I think it was mixed in with the fact that actually I really love to perform and I'm good at it and actually this would be the, the dream job. But also I wouldn't have to do normal life at the same time because I'm not made for normal life, right? You know, whatever that might be. Um, so there was a bit of a mixture of things. So it was very much up and down. And... Um, I, I never thought I was better than I was. It was the other way. I always thought that I was never as good as. I always compared myself. And I think that held me back. You know, I think that really held me back. But I was young. I was 19 years old. What do, what do, I didn't mm. know. I didn't know what I didn't know, right? So, um, yeah, so when that didn't happen, the rejection was massive. You know, how did they, we need to be teaching kids and the youth how to deal with rejection. You know, we need to be teaching them that. Maybe they do that in schools. I don't know. I'm 40 years old now. I don't know what the school system does, but I've got a daughter of seven. And I'll soon find out what they teach um, at the school. But, you know, that kind of stuff would have been a value then. And it just wasn't there. Um, but the, I learned very quickly that self-improvement means nothing. Yeah. It, unless you've got self-acceptance. And, you know, Lee's just said it at the bottom there. You know, acceptance is... The key, it really is. I to hate people saying that. But without, you know, self-acceptance transcends self-improvement every time. You know, otherwise those accolades mean nothing. Because if you keep achieving, you know, I work with many people that are like CEOs of companies and this, that and the other, and they think, but I don't feel that I deserve it. I don't feel good enough. And it's like, well, you keep getting all these things, but you don't accept who you are. <clears throat> Until that can happen, you can't move forward because... You've got to live with you. Every time you open your eyes and look in the mirror, you've got to see you, right? You've got to be with you. I'm, st I'm, this is, I'm with me forever until I go, right? Until I go to the next part of the journey, wherever that might be. So I had to find to get peace at that. And, uh, and a lot of it was about letting some stuff go. And, uh, and I realized that it wasn't for me. Um, not that I wasn't right for it. It wasn't right for me. And if my tr that's my understanding today. And I was meant for another purpose. And this is why we're here today, I guess. Yeah, thank you, mate, again, for sharing that. So for anybody maybe listening to this or who will listen to this, I, I believe like we're living in this, say, Insta-famous world. Like, everyone wants to be Insta-famous, right? And like you mentioned there, for you, like back all the way back then, as a 19-year-old, you wanted to to do it obviously because you enjoyed it, but also to become famous, right? So, so many people will say on Instagram and they're, and they're putting up these pictures and they're doing this, doing that and showing off and maybe sometimes going a little bit above what they can afford with certain things to show off, oh, look, I've just bought this, for instance. It could be a car, a watch, 
uh, even like a meal out or something like that. They're, they're spending money like it doesn't mean anything. But then they're actually then behind camera off off of Instagram. They're sort of sat there getting upset. So anyone that's maybe sort of chasing that fame and fortune, what sort of piece of advice could you give them from what you learned from what you've been through? Um, I always say question the motive. Always question the motive. Yeah. What's your motive for approaching that girl on a date? Is it because you want to make your partner or is it because you've got another agenda? You know, what's the reason for going for that job? Is it because you hate the job you're in now and you're desperate to get out? Or is it because you really want that job because you really love what they're about? So it's about the motive. So if the motive is about, um, you know, that fame that you talk about, it's because it's through validation, through low self-worth or low self-esteem. It's never going to pay off. It's never going to work. But if it's because you've got a talent you want to share with the world and it's something that you feel <clears throat> you're good at and, and, and you're aligned with it, then it's going to be a much better experience and a much more healthier one, right? So it's always, always about the motive in everything in our life. Question the motive. What is the motive? Uh, that's what I would say. And, and reflect. Reflect and look at that. You know, I didn't do that at 19. I didn't even do that at 21, 23. I spent my time pointing at everybody else. It's everyone else's fault. Resentful, you know. What is resentment anyway? Revisited sentiment over and over and over again in my mind. Um, and it probably wasn't until I was about 30 that I realised that I need to focus on what I want, not what I don't want. And what will be will be and what will come will come. But I need to put the action in. You know, I used to have that plan A and plan B. There is no plan B for me today. It's plan A. And plan A is just f flat out in plan A. Just keep doing what plan A is. And so actually question the motive is really important. And when I look at the Instagram, you know, I accept social media as what it is. Um, I use it because I like it. It keeps me connected and engaged. But I don't, um, I don't really care about keeping up with the Joneses, if you like. You know, I don't compare myself to what other therapists do or other, I'm not interested. I just do me. I do what I need to do. Those that follow it, if they resonate with it, great. You know, maybe that's the wrong approach, but that's enough for me at the moment. I, I don't want to get caught up in that because I can get, you know, I'm an, addic I'm an addictive personality, so I can get addicted to the likes and the reels and the hits and who else is doing that and what else should I talk about? I think, no, do you know what? I just talk about whatever I want to talk about. And that's it. Question the motive. Yeah, mate, I love that. Question the motive. Um, so for me, at one point in my life, the motive for me was money. I remember I sat there Googling highest paid jobs. Whether it made me happy or not, I didn't really care because I thought, fuck it, I'm going to find the highest paying job and I'm just going to do that job for another 20 years and get paid that amount of money. Like Money and happiness, like fulfilment is two different things. And there's no point in doing a job that you dislike or hate, in fact, just to get an income at the end of the month, each month, because you're going to do that for, for a long period in your life. And then you're going to be like, what the fuck have I been doing with my life for this amount of time? I think it's Tony Robbins says getting rich and not enjoying the journey is the ultimate fail. So for me, like I want to, I see this, I see this world where people stop chasing money, start pursuing purpose and focus on fulfillment because money is just numbers. And numbers go on forever, right? So if you're chasing money, you're going to be running for the rest of your life. Because we upgrade our lifestyle. Like we get paid a little bit more, maybe a thousand pound more, five thousand pound more. And we normalize that luxury of lifestyle that we've just upgraded to. And then we're always chasing that next level of life. Beautiful. I feel like I'm one of your reels. I love it. It's so powerful. I feel the passion when you talk. <laughs> about it but it's so true right thank so, you mate you know it, it's it's so true so there's a movie um it's a bit old now called fearless with jet lee right and there is a particular you know i'm a bit of a movie person and fantasy person i love all that stuff but there is a scene in this movie where he's he's left where he's at is in some kind of village and he's they're planting rice or vegetables whatever they're planting in in, in the water i think it's rice and what he's seeing is they're all taking their time. We need to get the job done. And he does it really quickly and beats everyone. And he's really achieved, you know, he's like, he smashed it. 
And when he looks, everyone is doing it slower, but stops and stands and breathes when the breeze comes, right? And then they continue, and he doesn't understand why they're doing it. What, the next day, the blind lady is now feeling her way with all the mistakes he's made and replanting everything that he's done. And when I watched that scene, it was really powerful because I used to operate like that. Rush, 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 get it done, chase, 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 got to get it done, got to be the best, got to be the first, blah, 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 like a lunatic. Um, but actually taking time to study your craft, taking time to work on who you are and what you're about, but then stopping and smelling the roses, stopping and feel that breeze. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, I work in the NHS full time and I have my private practice. Yes, okay, I work a lot, but that's a choice I make to, to provide for my family. But what I do is I make sure that when I'm not in that workspace, that I'm really present with my family and enjoying it. Otherwise, what's the bloody point in doing it? I'll lose the family, I'll lose all that stuff, I'll be very resentful, and then I'll probably end up drinking again because I'll be so unhappy. So I've learned that the hard way. Yeah, mate. Um, like, again, like you just mentioned there about just taking a pause for a moment. Because sometimes in life, the quickest way forward is to pause and sometimes even take a step or two back as well. And, uh, yeah, of course, it's about moving forward and progressing in life. But sometimes we do need to look back because we need to look back to see how far we come, but also to enjoy that view. Because what's the point in doing anything in life? if you're not going to say reap the rewards, because so many people get caught up in these jobs where they're working stupid hours because they're like, oh yeah, I earn so much money. I'm earning a hundred K a year. It sounds amazing, right? But when you're at work for like 16, 20 hours a day or something crazy, when do you ever get time to spend time with say friends, family, partners, loved ones? You, you, you don't, right? So it's super, super important to enjoy what you're doing, but also to reward yourself along the way, celebrate the mini milestones along the way. Definitely. So, it, you know, again, it's the motive, isn't it? If some people want to do that because that's what they want to do, great. You know, that's fine. But that's not in line. And, and remember, we do talk about going forward or going up that ladder and whatnot. But sometimes it's not always about going up. Sometimes it's about going to the side, you know? So I worked in a private rehab. And that was full on. And that took a lot of energy out of me. Right? I was on call all the time and I was knackered. So I went for a, a job. I left there and went to the side. It wasn't a progression up. It wasn't a step up. But it was a step to the side. And what that meant was better quality of life. Slightly less. But I had a better quality of life. So sometimes stepping to the side is really, really important. Some people get fixated in society around. You've got to keep going to the next job and up and up and up and up and up. Sometimes it's about going to the side. You know, consider your options. Mate, yeah, what you said again there about going to the side, the way that I look at it is they call it the Tarzan theory or the Tarzan method. So just think Tarzan, like we've all seen the movie Tarzan, that he's swinging through the jungle and he's grabbing hold of the vines, but it's not like everyone's in front of him. No, sometimes it's to the side, sometimes he's got to go back again. So yeah. to get to where he wants to go across the other side of the jungle, as to say, yeah. he's got to swing from one to the other. And sometimes that does mean going to the side or back. It's the same in life. Like sometimes life may put you on, a, say, a worse path or a worse track momentarily, but it could ultimately lead you to a best, better destination. So, Tane, before we sort of wrap this up, I have five quick questions that I want to blast through because I know we've uh, been on here for a little while. And I don't want to take all your time up, my friend, tonight, but we've got five questions that I want to start asking you. And, um, yeah, I've asked you these before, but I'm going to ask you again because your answers were fantastic. So if they're the same, or if not better, oh, this I can't is, wait. Oh, is that what you was asking? That was a couple of months ago, though. Gee, I'm going to remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Mate, you done it off the cuff. It was so good. So the first one is, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received, and why? Pass. So I thought it was a game show. Beg your pardon, right? Go back. Repeat the question. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received, and why? The alternative might be better. I'm just going to leave you with that. No, I was told the alternative might be better. So for me, how I operated, how I processed, it was always like, it's got to be this, it's got to be this, it's got to be this, it's got to be this. It was so intense and there was no manoeuvre around it. And what you're talking about there with, you know, the Tarzan theory is about adapting, right? 
But when I was so focused and vi tunnel visioned on one place, I'm not being like an adaptable person, right? So the alternative might be better. And thank God for that, because if I focus so so much that when I, I didn't achieve the record deal and the career that I wanted within music, not because I want for trying, but if I didn't really accept that the alternative might be better, I wouldn't see a possibility of looking at other attributes I have to offer and to move forward in my life. So the alternative might be better. And the reason that works in, in me is it works in all areas of my life because sometimes I'm a bit of a perfectionist. You know, I might have an idea to go to this restaurant, take my family out, you know, for Mother's Day, but left it too late. Um, so suddenly I'm really pissed off and I'm in a bad mood about it. Well, actually, the alternative might be better. Let's see if we've got something else. It's that strife of perfectionism that sometimes I don't have to do. And that's why that person said that to me all them years ago. And that served me in good stead. So that is my answer. Do I play for the uh, chance for the family holiday and the family car? <laughs> this, this, is this is what you could have won. This is what you could have won, man. Oh, it's, it's all right. I'm going to focus on what I want, Brian. I'm going to focus on what I want. <laughs> Right, so the next one is, what is the worst piece of advice that you've ever received and acted on, and what was the result? Mm. Yeah. Um, be a, stand up and be a man. That's what I was told. That was the worst advice. It was so toxic. Um, because, of course, that really hit when I felt like perhaps I wasn't b being a man, if you like, whatever that was supposed to be, you know? Like men don't show feelings or emotion, really. They're human beings. Um, so that wasn't, that wasn't really great. It was toxic masculinity. Um, and that really um, hit me hard because I was feeling less than. And so I bought into that, maybe that's the truth. You know, it hits home. You know, maybe, maybe they're right, you know, that kind of stuff. And that was a long time ago, so that wasn't useful. And that was really detrimental. But that's not that person's fault. They are where they are. They, they're doing what they're doing. But I believe they knew what they were doing. And, um, and it worked. Uh, but it won't work now. It doesn't work now. No. There's nothing that I think anyone can say now. Um, unless I think it's true. So if I think it's true, you know, if I, if I put on weight and someone says, oh, you know, you're looking a bit chubby there, mate. You're putting a bit of timber on. You know, it starts speaking to me in that way. If I'm really feeling not great about the way I, I might react instead of respond, right? Whereas I can look at that and think, well, actually, yeah, you're probably right. I need to, need to do something about that if I want to do something about that. So it's the way it lands, you know? So, um, but at that time, I was particularly vulnerable. And I think that was probably the most useless piece of advice I was ever given or statements. But yeah. Yeah, I mean... I'm sure many of us that are listening to this have heard that, say, especially with the guys here, be a man. Like, what, what the fuck does that mean? What does it mean, yeah. right? So, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a, a super, super important one. So, well, you know what it was? I'll tell you the context. It was someone I dated a long time ago was being an absolute nuisance. They were completely out of their box, caused a massive big argument, and then wanted me to pick up the pieces. And there I am, potentially going to get the crap kicked out of me by about five, six blokes. Stand up and be a man. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. I'm going to go and get a kick in when actually I agree with them and disagree with your behaviour and you want me to go and do that. Actually, I don't really want to go and do that. So, you know, that, 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 was, that was the feedback. It was horrible. You know. I, was mm. a teenager. I mean, that could, have that could have ended quite badly, couldn't it, right? So... Well, exactly. No, it could have been in a situation like you, like you were in that past, you know. Yeah, exactly. Out of blue. Exactly. Exactly. So the next thing that I want to ask you about then is like in life, I believe there's a big part of life, say, is about moving forward, progressing, learning new things. Yeah. But a big part of life or even bigger part sometimes is about unlearning certain things. So what, say, one piece of advice or what one thing did you have to unlearn throughout your life? Can't remember what I said last time. Um... What do I have to unlearn? Um, one thing I have to unlearn. Well, there's been many things. I'm just trying to think of what. Pretty much, <laughs> I have to unlearn everything, um, really. But um, what did I have to unlearn? Um, like around beliefs and stuff, maybe childhood programming, etc. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, I had to unlearn really that about the expectations. There was always those expectations. I had to unlearn high expectations is what I'm referring to. Always had high expectations. And, and I think I learned that. That was a learned behavior. And what happens there is if you always have high expectations, people will never measure, never meet it. So what happens? Yeah, they never meet it. So therefore, I had to unlearn that. I had to lower, you know, maybe not lower the bar because that sounds negative in itself, itself. But I had to really check my motive on what those high expectations were, you know, and what the payoff from setting those were. And it, it just wasn't getting me anywhere. You know, it got to a place where it was like, oh, the tree has been planted on the other side of the road. And, oh, the person's parked outside my house. You know, it was those kind of really unhealthy um, levels of expectations. And what that was all about was perfection. You know, and if we could sort the outside out, maybe I might feel better on the inside. So I had to unlearn all that. Um, that it's not to have no expectations, um, but it's actually stop putting all of my eggs in one basket. You know, get many baskets, man. Get many baskets. Yeah, I love that. Many baskets. Nice. Um, so the next question would be then, what is the greatest lesson that you learn from your most painful life experience? Mm, the greatest lesson is if you don't pick up the first drink, you don't get drunk. It's impossible. You can't get drunk if you don't pick up the first drink. And when I picked up that first one, I don't stop. And then my, you know, it's like my head used to just talk to me all the time. So I'd be engaged with you and my head will be doing this, tap, tap, tap in the back. And it'll get louder and louder and louder until I could just have a drink and then get quieter. And then I'll be okay, I'll be talking to you again. And then all of a sudden it's back again, getting louder and wouldn't shut up. And that's pretty much how my addiction uh, went. So if you don't pick up the first one, you can't get drunk, you can't get high. Um, and I didn't think it was that easy, but it makes sense when you say it back. It's like, well, that kind of makes sense. Um, because someone like me, when I start, I don't stop. You know, and I'll justify the behavior because I don't drink every day. I'm not on a park bench with a brown paper bag. Well, that person didn't start out that way. You know, and I learned a lot of that from meeting really real people and listening to their stories and really humbling self to really say, listen, I need to hear what these guys got to say. You know, people who come from worse situations than me were getting sobriety and getting better. I was thinking, wow, there's something in that. Maybe there's a chance for me, right? So it really helped me and learn in good stead to sort of really listen to others, not just hear them, but really listen, you know? I was told to put the cotton wool out of my, out of my ears and put it in my mouth, <laughs> basically. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean what you just said there about the, the, the drinks as well, you know, like if you don't drink the first drink, you can't get drunk basically. Like that's, it's so simple, right? But for the individual, I'm sure they feel it's not that simple. So this could even be leading on to my next question, which the next, the next question would be knowing what you know now, what one piece of advice would you give to your 20 year old self? You could even say your younger self or anybody even listening that's maybe noticed those sort of addictive, is it traits? I'm not even sure what the right word is. Maybe, maybe that addictive behavior, they're noticing it. What one piece of advice could you even give to your younger self or to maybe that younger person or even that any person that's listening today that needs to hear what you've learned? Okay. Well, uh, I do this work a lot with clients, so for me it's quite easy to tap into, but I would always say to my younger self, you are enough, and know that you do not need the approval of others to measure your success. You do what you want to do. You're not going to be for everyone. That's just life. Yeah? And focus on the one person out of ten that says they don't like you, and forget that nine people said they like you. Don't be that guy. It's okay to do you, you are enough, you don't need the validation of others. Go out and try and test these things and see what happens. 
you know, but go and enjoy it and learn from it all. But don't be held back by seeking the validation of others because you are enough, you know what your worth is, and go and do it. That's that's the kind of stuff I would say. Yeah, man, that's so powerful. Like, so, so powerful, especially for, again, a lot of young guys as well. Like, some of the things that you mentioned just then about, say, uh, be a man, man up, and all that sort of stuff. So I feel like many, many people could take a lot away from what you just said there as well about you are enough and stop looking at everybody else to almost validate your happiness or your success or just you as a person. Like In life, winners focus on winning, but losers focus on winners. So stop looking at everybody else on their journey and comparing your journey because you're comparing your, say, chapter one to their chapter 10. And of course, you're going to feel shit. You're going to feel so shit when you see how far that other person is ahead in their life because you've only just got started. But don't ever let, say, your ego stop you from starting because we have this ego that's saying, oh, I don't want to start at the start because that person's all the way there. I, I, I'm never going to catch up with them. I'm, I'm not good enough to, to get going or I'm better than starting at the start and not knowing anything. Just get the ball rolling. Get moving in your life in the direction that you want to go and focus on your lane, stay in your lane and give it time to... to to unfold yeah absolutely and if you don't feel you can do any of that right the one thing i would say as an added extra is ask for help you absolutely can go and ask for help and that's one thing i didn't do you know because there was fear of shame you know fear of being judged so it's not just ask for help by anyone there will always be that person hopefully for someone that they'll look up to or aspire to or think, actually, I could really trust them with some of my stuff. If you've got those relationships, talk to that person. The person who's really invested and cares about you because, you know, holding it in your head didn't help me. It doesn't help a lot of people. It's sharing that with the right people and, and, and having that humility to say, actually, hi, I, I, need, I need some help over here. Uh, and just whether it's just being listened to, it doesn't necessarily have to have the answers, but just having that time to be able to process and reflect and, and just to hear it back in your own voice, what you're saying. I mean, that's how therapy works. I don't tell people the answers. You know, it might help guide and coach along the way, but quite often it's about them actually vocalising it, verbalising it out loud, their issues. And, and that in itself, they then come up with their solution. So it's just having that um, ability to ask for help. And I think we're, we're getting better at that. But, we're, but more of that will be, will be useful. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, my friend. So, Tane, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today and doing this with me because I believe what you said today will help so many people. And it's helped me as well. Like The stuff that you say, I, I feel like so impactful and inspiring as well. So just thank you. So if Thanks, anyone's mate. listening and they want to, say, reach out to you or follow your journey, check out what you're doing, connect with you in any way at all, what's the best way for someone to do that? Um, so just go on to my Instagram. Um, it's, it's on there at Tanner therapy. Uh, it's got a link to my website there. Um, it's all there. Just message me on there if you want to, if you like what, what I'm doing and just connect. And if you're in trouble and you want to still connect, that's what I'm there for. No, absolutely. Go ahead and do so. Or you can speak to Ryan, who's my PA. He'll, he'll respond. Uh, accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> Tana, thank you so much my friend for today i really enjoyed this episode and you're welcome yeah no thank you is, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we end i think you're amazing i love your journey and um you're so like in so many ways you're so the opposite to me but you but we're the same and and what i mean by that is when i met you at that clubhouse um uh, part in the park I get you know I'm, I'm I'm quite an extroverted character right I don't know if you could tell um so you you know I'll I will work the room I, I get in, I get enjoyment out of that and I buzz and I just you know but you'll get the same feeling but being slightly more reserved and I remember looking at you and I was thinking the geese is just so chilled out right but then you'd be laughing once you're calm and relaxed and what really amazes me is that we can have such different personality types, but have so many similarities. And I love that. And that's why I like, that's why I like the app. That's why I like mixing with, 
all different types of people. We can just vibe and we've all got different personality types and you're one of them. And, uh, you know, you're a great guy. People like you, people like Dale, um, you know, Ryan that was on. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing you again at the next one. But I just really love what you're about. You've got lovely energy and you're genuine. And that's what I like. I spent too much time being around people full of bullshit. Um, and I used to speak my own bullshit. And I'm more about authenticity. And uh, I'll only bother with people that bother with me now. Um, so I'm not chasing anything anymore. But you are one of these people. And I don't speak to you all the time. But when I do, I feel I get great value. Um, and I really feel like I learn and grow. And just I just feel something really nice. I don't know what it is. I think maybe a bromance is starting to uh, emerge <laughs> here. I don't know. But no, man, I just, I really, you know, people like Kev, I just really love what you're about. So just want to thank you as well for, for doing what you're doing. I've seen you speak. Uh, on some of those stages and I hope to share one of them stages with you in the future oh Tanner thank you so much my friend honestly it does mean the world to me and no obviously the same with you like such a nice guy and yeah that day that we first met in that part there face to face like what an incredible guy you are and you made me smile the whole day so just keep doing what you're doing <laughs> you're helping so many people too and like you're, you're, you're a great guy as well I'll never forget that my friend so thank you so much for coming on today I really Thanks, appreciate mate. you. Thank you, everybody, as well, for coming in, tuning in. And, yeah, no, guys, check out this episode. I'm going to stick it back, back on my uh, IGTV. I'm going to cut it up and make some reels in the near future. But, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tanner, and we'll catch up soon. Take care, mate. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, my friend. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.